What's going on Coyote Pack and welcome to a special Ask a Biologist. We're calling this the YouTube Back to School Special. That's because you guys are going back to school. And we figured why not team up with YouTube to launch a special back to school playlist that's a bunch of educational Brave Wilderness episodes to accompany this special Ask a Biologist edition. So when they're back to school, they're gonna have supplemental material that's coming from us to learn more. Which pretty much officially makes us not only substitute teachers, but legit teachers at this point. We graduated, we're official teachers? I think we're officially teachers now. Okay, so you know, you're gonna see that in your report card. So Mario, to get this kicked off, we're gonna do a, a special one. that will be kind of like our Ask a Biologist that you've seen before, mm -hmm. but we're really honing in today on biomes. Biomes, yeah. You know, biome is essentially where an animal lives, right? The reason why an animal looks the way it does is because it has adapted to living in a certain area. Right, so we're gonna go through a handful of different biomes. We're gonna talk to you about some of the animals that live in those biomes. Yep. And by the end of this, you're gonna have an incredible education, a wealthy knowledge of the different biome systems on our planet and some of the animals that live in them. We're gonna have props, we're gonna have vocabulary words, we're probably gonna have some craziness, and Mara, if you're ready, I'm ready. I know the Coyote Pack is ready. Let's get into the first biome, which is one of my favorites, rainforest. Rainforests, I have to agree with you, it is one of my favorites as well. Rainforests are probably one of the most biodiverse ecosystems in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what defines a rainforest as being a rainforest? Great question. Now. There are actually different types of rainforests, believe it or not. There's what we consider our traditional rainforests that are in higher temperature uh, zones. Mm -hmm. uh, those are traditionally just called tropical mm -hmm. rainforests. And then there are temperate rainforests, which are actually in cooler elevations. But nonetheless, they are rainforests because they all share one thing in common. What's that? Rain? Rain. Okay. Right? So a rainforest needs to have a high uh, yield of rain mm -hmm. every year. Uh, so basically rainforests are some of the wettest habitats in the world that are not actually oceans or freshwater habitats. Sounds musty and moldy and damp and miserable most of the time. And whether you're in a cold rainforest or a hot rainforest, you're always going to be soggy. You're going to be soggy, but the animals that live there thrive in these temperatures and in these moist conditions. Okay, so let's get into some of the stats when it comes mm. to rainforest, because this is really interesting. I'll read off this first one here. Rainforests cover only 8% of the Earth's surface, which equates to only 3% of the planet's total surface area. Right. I would have imagined that there would be way more rainforest than that, but that's partially because we're destroying rainforests every year. And that's crazy because as we mentioned earlier, rainforests account for half of all terrestrial biodiversity in the world. Mind boggling. Yes, so we have this small percentage that is actually very, very important when it comes to ecosystems and species. Okay, so the world's largest rainforest is? The Amazon. Right. Let's see, I've got the trusty yep. globe here. I don't know if, Kids nowadays have one of these. Heck yeah, all kids need to have globes. Kids of all ages, young kids, adult kids, you can never go wrong with a globe. Now they're digital, I think. It's Google Earth. Google Earth, right? But this is like the old school Google Earth. Yeah, so the Amazon is located in South America. And the Amazon is 40% of South America. Yeah. Which is essentially equal to the size of the continental United States. That is that is my favorite fact right there. So yeah. think about it. The United States, continental United States, is about the same size as the Amazon. You can call the Amazon the lungs of the world. And why is that? How does, the, how does this process work? So you can think of a rainforest as a filtration system. Mm -hmm. They're very important in one key factor, and that is absorbing carbon dioxide mm -hmm. from the atmosphere. So carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, which means it actually goes up into the atmosphere, gets stuck, and will, over time, warm the earth. Mm -hmm. So at this moment in time, we are going through exceeded levels of carbon dioxide, which are warming the globe. Now, what the rainforest does, particularly trees, is they do something called photosynthesis. Plants essentially eat carbon dioxide. They eat them, and then they poop out oxygen. Which is, of course, how we and all the other animals survive. Right, 
Every year, the Amazon absorbs 2 billion tons of carbon dioxide. That's a lot of carbon dioxide. It is. So with that said, what if we start removing trees and we start causing deforestation in the Amazon rainforest and other rainforests around the world? More carbon dioxide, warmer temperatures, less oxygen for us as humans. Yeah. yeah. So the preservation of the rainforest is incredibly important. Now, not only because of the production of oxygen, this lung type system for our planet, but because of the species that live there. So right. let's get into uh, a couple of our favorite animals that call the rainforest home. Right, so once again, the rainforest is home to half of the world's terrestrial species. So huge biodiversity. And one of those species is the ocelot. Everybody loves the ocelot. Probably right. one of the coolest episodes we ever filmed. Yeah, yeah, we got to pal around with a young ocelot in the Costa Rican rainforest, and it was amazing. Mm -hmm. And these little critters, because they are fairly small. For cats. For cats. Yeah. Um, have some special adaptations that allow them to live and thrive in the rainforest. Mm -hmm. And they're characterized by their short coats, mm -hmm. their spotted rosetted pattern, mm -hmm. um, and that really long tail, which of course is used for balance. And right. these cats have some of the best balance out of, I'd say, any of the cats. Right. And that allows them to thrive in rainforests, because rainforests are usually heavily canopied and there's full of vegetation, right? You got the bigger trees, then you got the understory. Mm -hmm. And so these cats will be able to almost become arboreal and they could just navigate throughout that web of plants. Right. For perspective, how big is an ocelot? Uh, on average, max is out at around 30 pounds, right? Right. Yeah, so the body size, I mean, it's bigger than a house cat. I'd say about the size of a medium dog. Not very big, but that's okay because they have a lot of small things right. that they can actually hunt. Right. So what do ocelots uh, hunt? Well, anything pretty much that will fit into their mouths. So reptiles, amphibians, birds, smaller mammals, they'll even take advantage of carrion if they find something that's dead in the mm -hmm. rainforest. Um, I would say they're opportunistic, but certainly carnivores. What's incredible is that they are nocturnal. They specialize in hunting at night, right. which is gonna get us into our first vocabulary word of the day. Now to thrive at night, to, to be hunting at night, you've got to have some special senses. Right. Right. Eyesight's got to be on point. Right. So the ocelot and many species that are nocturnal have this system in their eyes called the tapidum lucidum. First vocabulary word of the day. Yep. So the tapidum lucidum is essentially this reflective layer of cells in the back of the retina of a nocturnal species and those cells actually reflect any available light. Mm -hmm. So even if there's just a little bit of light from the moon, for example, they'll actually absorb that, reflect it back, and allow the animal to see in it at night. Now to know if a species has the tapetolucidum, mm -hmm. it's very simple. You shine a flashlight, and if you see a reflection back, that's the tapetolucidum working. So for example, at night, if you've ever like, seen your cat or, or seen a cat cross the road, you're gonna see that reflection, that eerie glow of the eyes. Mm -hmm. And that is the tap of the lucid. Very cool. Mm -hmm. well, let's move from the ocelot to something a little smaller and still equally as unique and famous from the, from the rainforest, specifically of Costa Rica. Yeah, so because rainforests are so moist, they're full of rain and water, there's one group of animals that thrives for sure, and that is the amphibians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in particular, we're gonna talk about the red-eyed leaf frog. Lots of frogs in the rainforest, but I think when we were putting together this, this lesson plan, we said, what is the one frog that everybody truly loves? It's gotta be the red-eyed leaf frog. So let's talk a little bit about these red-eyed leaf frogs, because we certainly have had the chance to get up close with them before. Mm -hmm. What makes these frogs so unique? Well, they're distinguished by their big red eyes. Mm -hmm. So you can't miss them. They are kind of a lime green color mm -hmm. and they have these awesome appendages. So their toes have these big pads that are orange. That allows them to just stick to any surface, especially slippery plants. Right, mm -hmm. it's crazy. They have like the most incredible suction pads on their skin. In fact, the one episode where we filmed the red eye leaf frog, it jumped right off of my hand and straight onto my face. And it's the weirdest feeling to have a frog clamped on your face. You can feel those little suctiony yeah. toes gripping onto you. It's a very bizarre feeling. And they also have a very unique smell. 
Red-eyed leaf frogs smell unlike any other frog species I think I've ever inter interacted with. Well, I, I don't think I've been that close to one. So what is the smell? I would say it's kind of like, you know, if you leave a, a piece of citrus fruit out too long and it starts to get like a mold or a must to it. Okay. It's almost like a rotten piece of citrus fruit. Excellent. Um, well, that is Coyote's scientific observation of the day. Yeah, well, there, there <laughs> you have it. When it comes to red-eyed leaf frogs, no one's been closer than I have. So these frogs are also primarily nocturnal. Right. During the day, they're hiding, uh, tucked usually up underneath leaves in a moist spot to keep them out of the range of any diurnal snakes or birds, but at night, they become very active, not only in their calls, but also in their activity to hunt for food. And at night, they're gonna be hunting insects, invertebrates, mm -hmm. basically anything that they could um, ambush and just jump onto and just engulf with their big mouths. And, you know, their name leaf frog is very easy to distinguish why they're called leaf frogs. And as you said, they just hang out on leaves. They're right. not really up high in the canopy. They're a little lower. But they're still considered arboreal. Yes. Because they are up in trees of some sort. Even if those trees are lower, it still technically makes them an arboreal species versus a terrestrial species. And I believe arboreal is our second vocabulary word for the rainforest section. It is, it is. And, and this is a tough one. Are you ready? I'm ready. Are you guys ready? Arboreal, what arboreal. is it? Arboreal, this is, this is a tough one. Animals that live in trees slash canopy. Can you guys remember that? Arboreal, an animal that lives up in the trees. Right. Whether it's high up in the trees or low down in the trees, if it's off the ground, it is arboreal. Right, there are many arboreal species in rainforest because there's a lot of plants and trees. Very cool. Well, that pretty much wraps it up for the world of the rainforest. I feel like we could go on forever talking about the creatures there, but let's transition from the moisture world of the rainforest into the dry world of the deserts, another mm -hmm. one of our planet's most diverse ecosystems. Even though for the most part, you think of deserts as being these vast barren wastelands, they actually have a lot of creatures living there. That's correct. And it's a vast difference, contrast from a rainforest to a desert. And would you want to guess what is one of the characteristics of a desert? Ah, lack of rainfall. There you go. So rainforest is extreme rainfall, Desert is minimal rainfall. Right, so we go from both extremes. All right, let's get into some of the characteristics about deserts. What makes a desert desert? How much of the planet is covered in desert? And then we're gonna get into some of its creatures. Okay, so just like a rainforest, there's different types of rainforest. Mm -hmm. There's different types of deserts. Uh, this one might seem obvious, but there are hot slash dry deserts, mm -hmm. right? There are semi-arid deserts, meaning it's not as arid as or dry as hotter ones. There's scrub deserts, mm -hmm. which means there are some types of vegetation. There's coastal deserts, so those are the ones that are close to the ocean. And then of course, there's the cold deserts. Ooh, you don't oftentimes think about there being a cold desert. Right, so all these habitats share one uh, a few things in common mm -hmm. to become a desert. Little rainfall. Yeah right? High evaporation rates. Mm -hmm. So when there is water, it evaporates quickly. Right. So it's not being able to be utilized by the plants and such. Mm -hmm. And then this one is interesting. If you've ever been to a desert and you've experienced it during the day and at night, you will know that there's a high fluctuation in temperatures. What happens at night in a desert? It gets very cold, right? You a would, lot colder than you would think. You would not think that, right? So if you go out to the desert, you should bring a sweater. And the reason for that is because there's the lack of water. Water regulates temperature. Mm -hmm. Water keeps temperatures generally at a constant. Without water, it fluctuates greatly. So when it comes to the statistics of deserts, uh, I love this stat here, this is crazy. Deserts cover 33% of the Earth's land surface. Mm -hmm. That's a large percentage of desert. And I guess that encompasses a number of different desert environments, but right. it's crazy when you think of how little rainforest there is as compared to desert. And I love this stat that you have here. This is a good one. Believe it or not, the largest desert on Earth is the Antarctic Polar Desert, which covers 5.5 million square miles. So our biggest desert is actually a cold desert. It is. A cold I feel like everybody else would have been like, oh yeah, it's gotta be the Sahara in Africa. Right, so there's little rainfall in these Arctic regions. Right. Now when it comes to a non-polar desert, the largest is? The Sahara. Right. In Northern Africa. 
the Sahara is what you would consider more of your typical desert. Mm -hmm. you, people usually think of big sand dunes, very fine sand grains, and very hot. Now, despite the deserts having harsh conditions, believe it or not, there are species that thrive in the desert. Right. Uh, and they've adapted to these harsh conditions with some really specialized features. Right. Starting off with one of our favorites, the Gila Monster. The Gila Monster. The Gila Monster is the only non-venomous lizard in the United States. Of course, as you guys know, it is Wait, a lizard that I was- Wait, non-venomous? Oh, did I say non-venomous? Yeah. It is the only venomous lizard in the United States. Mm -hmm. And it is one of the most painful bites I've ever taken. Remember, an unintentional bite, but this is a life-size Gila Monster cast. So that's a replica from our friends at Bone Clones. Yep. And Gila Monsters are superbly adapted to living in desert environments. Mm -hmm. Some of that is simply the fact that they are watertight. Reptiles actually don't have pores that allow for sweating. Nothing's going to actually evaporate from their bodies, which means they can retain a lot of water. How do Gila monsters avoid the heat of the day? Well, from what we know, they are incredible at finding places to hide. Your odds of coming across Gila monster are very unlikely unless you're out venturing at night or in the early morning. Those are the times that we've seen them. But they stay down in burrows during the day. Yeah. Honestly, they don't even really dig their own burrows. They just kind of move into other things' burrows, eat whatever's living in there, and then have a nap. So, check out this stat. Gila monsters spend 90% of the year in estivation. And that is a vocabulary word. Ooh, new vocabulary word, estivation, which means? Estivation is a prolonged torpor or dormancy of an animal during a hot or dry period. Wow. So you've heard of hibernation, mm -hmm. right? That's when you're in a cold habitat. Well, estivation is when you live in a warm habitat. Right. So essentially, if you don't want to overheat, just go hide underground somewhere. I would have to say the Gila monster may be one of the laziest reptiles on the planet with the amount of time that they spend snoozing and avoiding the heat. And you may be asking yourselves, well, how do they manage to sustain their nutrition if they are underground for 90% of their lives? What's unique about the Gila monster is that they will eat and eat and eat during the rainy season and in their tail, they will keep fat reserves. So mm. they store fat in here that they will live off of for all of that time that they're estivating underground. Now, what do Gila monsters eat? Well, they certainly are opportunistic. They will eat small mammals, other reptiles, amphibians, I guess, if they came across them, but they specialize in seeking out baby animals in nests or eggs and baby birds. They love eggs. Love eggs. Gila monsters are kind of slow moving, so they have to have slow prey. Mm -hmm. And the slowest prey out there is eggs of ground nesting birds. Right, or baby animals. Now, real quick, you have experienced the venom of a Gila monster. I have, right? I have. How does it feel to be bitten by a Gila monster? Uh, well, they say that only a complete idiot is ever bitten by a Gila monster. I guess I fell into that category by getting my hand too close to one and it uh, reared around and bit my thumb. But the venom of the Gila monster uh, will attack all of your nerves. It's incredibly mm. painful. Never something that anybody would want to go through. And uh, yeah. The best way to encounter a Gila monster is simply to admire it from a safe distance. That's why they make that little zoom in feature right. on your phone. You can zoom in and get the picture. You don't have to get too close to the lizard. I guess good news is if you are concerned about Gila monsters, which you shouldn't, is the fact that, well, you're likely never gonna see them. And if you do, consider yourself lucky. Yeah. Take a picture from a safe distance. Absolutely. So while you shouldn't be afraid of Gila monsters, let's transition to something that most people are likely afraid of that lives in the desert, but that honestly, you really don't need to be afraid of. Right, and that is uh, tarantulas. Yeah, the desert blonde tarantula, one of the largest tarantula species in the Western hemisphere. They're big, they're furry, they've got fangs, but they're really pretty sweet creatures. Yeah, I like to think of tarantulas as the teddy bears of the arachnid world. I think that's a good way of looking at them. They're very cute and cuddly if you really get to know yeah. them. Yeah, and, and, and once you know some of the stats and, and facts about them, you'll realize they're not dangerous. Right. For example, the one thing we have to understand is that all spiders are venomous. Yes. All spiders. So tarantulas, your little spiders you see in your house, they're all venomous. But the difference is the level of toxicity. Mm -hmm. Not all spiders are super toxic like the Sydney funnel web spiders mm -hmm. or black widow spiders. And luckily for us, all tarantula species 
their venom is not toxic enough to be considered dangerous to a human. Right. Because if it was, then that would be scary because they are massive spiders. Yeah, so size doesn't necessarily equate to toxic venom. That's about the size of a, a normal desert blonde tarantula. Mm -hmm. um, if you see one walking around in the desert, you can get close to it, you can take pictures. It might try to scurry off. It's not running at you. It's trying to get away, but it's definitely not something you need to be afraid of. And they're very common and they are primarily nocturnal. So they'll come out at night. Right. During the day, they'll be hiding underground or under logs and rocks. So I think one of the most distinguishable features of tarantulas besides their size is the fact that they're covered in hair. Now, the hairs aren't something that necessarily you need to be afraid of, unless you're gonna try to get close and interact with the tarantula, because one of their primary defenses is to actually flick hairs off of their abdomen, which can get into the eyes or nose of a potential predator, and they're mm. very irritating. Very irritating. Mm -hmm. Once it gets on you, they're so fine, they actually burrow into your skin. Yeah. Very itchy. Very itchy. Yeah. So the hairs also pick up vibration and pressure in the environment. Mm -hmm. So when a tarantula is crawling to the desert, anything that's moving, believe it or not, well, the vibration will actually go through the spider and they could actually feel it through all those little tiny hairs. Now, I say we wrap up on the spiders and the desert, but I love this last fact that you've got here. It is estimated that five out of 100 people in the United States alone have a phobia of spiders, which is our last vocabulary word in the desert section, arachnophobia. Arachnophobia, which is simply the fear of arachnids and spiders. Spiders, scorpions, sulpigids, uh, vinegaroons, like if it's an arachnid and you're afraid ticks. of it, ticks are technically arachnids. You've got arachnophobia, but hopefully a lot of our videos, this one even included, is helping anybody out there that's afraid of spiders overcome their fear of them because they do an incredibly uh, positive job for the ecosystem by eating a lot of the pest insects that right. you don't want to get bummed by. Okay, moving on to our next ecosystem. This is the world of fresh water. Mm, yes, because when it comes down to it, we live in a water world. Right. Yeah. Now, freshwater habitats are very unique and not as common as you would think. Hmm, okay. So what are some of the characteristics of freshwater? I see here that they are divided into lakes, ponds, streams, rivers, and wetlands, which would right. be, you know, like the marshy, swampy area where there's lots of snapping turtles. Right. What affects a freshwater habitat is the flow of water, mm -hmm. right? So some areas have a high flow of water, some areas are what we call stagnant, they're just still. The amount of light that actually goes through the water, which is going to affect your plant life. Mm -hmm. The salinity. Which is the salt. Which is a salt, right? So salinity is very important and a freshwater habitat has to be less than 1% saline in order to be considered freshwater. Okay. Temperature, right? So the very temperature important. of the water is gonna be very important to the animals that are gonna live in that habitat. And then of course, there is the chemistry of the water. Now don't worry, we're not gonna go into crazy chemistry. You know, this is a, this is a biology class, not a chemistry class. Uh, but the pH, the dissolved oxygen, and the nutrients that are in that water are gonna vary depending on if it's a pond, a lake, a stream, and so on. So when it comes to the statistics of freshwater ecosystems. I love this. This is just like the rainforest. Only 3% of the water on earth is fresh. Now that's, that's a pretty crazy stat because what is the one thing that all terrestrial animals need to survive? Fresh water. Fresh water. So essentially fresh water is not an unlimited resource on earth. Mm -hmm. Fresh water is something that we constantly, especially as humans, have to be aware of and how we're getting that clean, fresh water. Right. So when it comes to largest places of fresh water, obviously the collection of the Great Lakes is a, a, a great example. Uh, Superior, Michigan, Huron, Erie, and Ontario are five Great Lakes that right. make up the largest surface freshwater system on Earth. Right. So surface freshwater. Mm. Now, here's another stat. Of that 3% of water, only 0.3% of that is found in the surface water, such as these lakes. Wow. Now, the rest of it is actually in frozen glaciers. Wow. Which is leading to the fact that glaciers are melting right now mm -hmm. because of global temperatures increasing. Right. So we are losing a lot of our fresh water. Right, because that water is melting and then going into the ocean. It's going into the ocean and now becoming more saline and yeah. distributing. So 
Pretty interesting facts. Now, when it comes to species that live in fresh water, there, of course, is a world of animals we could talk about, but we're gonna hone in on a couple of our favorites. The first one being one of your favorites, Mario, the American alligator. American alligator. We got an awesome replica alligator skull here from our friends at Bone Clones. Watch yep. out for those teeth. So let's talk about alligators and what makes them so unique. Mm -hmm. So the American alligator primarily lives in freshwater habitats. Mm -hmm. One of the most famous of these habitats is of course a big wetland ecosystem called the Everglades, right. which is found in Florida. So alligators and crocodilians have adapted to live as aquatic animals. Mm -hmm. They have long streamlined bodies, long tails, and they have adaptations that allow them to submerge and hunt very efficiently. Right. And one of the primary aspects that allow them to hunt beneath the surface is their ability to see underwater, which brings us to our first vocabulary word within the freshwater ecosystem. Yep. The nictitating membrane. Nictitating membrane. One of my favorites. Mario, explain to everybody what this membrane is. So the nictitating membrane is essentially a third eyelid. Ooh. Now, crocodilians, when they submerge, this nictitating membrane reflexively covers the eye and it is clear. You can think about it as a goggle and it'll actually just slide into place. We've actually filmed that several times yes. in the past. They'll slide into place and they're ready to go. Right. When it comes to the alligators and crocodiles, the caiman, any crocodilians, this is one of the key features that allows them to be as stealthy as they are beneath the surface and whether they're sneaking up on their prey under the water or up along the edge lines where the land meets the water, it certainly is a great tool to have when it comes to being an ambush predator. Right, and that leads to another aspect, and that's the fact that the nostrils, the eyes, and the ears are set high above the head. Mm -hmm. So an alligator or crocodile, no matter how big it is, can literally come up to the surface and only those portions are exposed. So they are very stealthy. Now, once they do catch your prey, crocodilians, like alligators, have some of the strongest biting forces in the animal kingdom. Right. How strong is the bite force of an alligator? Uh, measured close to 3,000 pounds per square inch. Yep. That is a powerful bite force. And trust me, from being bitten by alligators before, it's not a place you want to find your fingers, your hand, your leg, any part of your body. No. So moving a little further north in range of species, our next creature we want to talk about, if we go from reptiles with crocodilians to an amphibian that we absolutely love. Yep. The hellbender. The hellbender, also called the snot otter. Everybody's gotta have a nickname. Now, why is it called a snot otter? Well, kind of because they look like otters, in all fairness, and they are covered with a slippery mucus that pretty much feels like snot. So, their snot otter, I guess, is fitting. When they're out of the water, they're very boogery. Yeah. Is that a word, boogery? Yeah, boogery is a good word. It's because when they're underwater, they're very buoyant. You know, they can kind of effortlessly move on the, the surface or the, mm -hmm. the basin of a creek or river system. Right. But what makes these salamanders so unique? They are the largest salamander species in North America. Yep. And in terms of the world, they rank third. Hellbenders can get close to two feet long yeah. and weigh four pounds. That's like the size of a, of a toy chihuahua. Right. They could probably eat a chihuahua. I don't know about that, but I think it would be a pretty cool matchup to see a chihuahua going toe to toe with a hellbender. My money is on the, on the hellbender. I think the chihuahua is probably going to win. They're pretty feisty. I don't know. All right, put your money on it. So these two feet long salamanders are going to thrive in freshwater habitats and they eat mainly crayfish. Crayfish. They love their crayfish. Everybody loves a surf and turf menu, especially when that surf is fresh crayfish. Yep, and yeah, one of the stats is they basically, 90% of their diet is crayfish. Right, yeah, it's crazy. They kind of crunch them up, suck out the insides, and then spit out the exoskeleton. Now, because hellbenders live in fresh water, mm -hmm. um, they actually have to have a lot of dissolved oxygen in their water because they don't necessarily breathe through lungs. They breathe through their bodies. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why they look so boogery is because they have all these folds along their body. Right. And those folds actually absorb oxygen. They, they help in respiration. Mm -hmm. So when you find hellbenders, you're gonna find them in fast flowing streams. They're gonna be under rocks. The streams are gonna be moving. The water's gonna be moving. It's gonna be allowing the oxygen to flow through their bodies and they're gonna be healthy. And in fact, 
hellbenders are indicator species. Yes. Right? So what does that mean? An indicator species is something that tells you how healthy an environment is. If you find a hellbender or a mud puppy or really any salamander species, it means there is not a lot of pollution within that water ecosystem. Because remember, like Mario was saying, those amphibians absorb a lot of their environment through their skins. So where there's pollutants, you will not find the amphibians. And in a healthy ecosystem, a healthy stream environment, hellbenders can live up to 30 plus years. That's crazy. They're, they're long lived. Yeah, very yeah. cool. Okay, so that's gonna wrap it up for the hellbender and the freshwater ecosystem. And now let's transition into our last biome, the world of marine creatures. Right. Earlier, we said that we live in a water world. Mm -hmm. And that is because, here's the official Google Maps globe. Yeah. What color is the globe? Blue, mostly. Mostly blue. And that is because the world is primarily covered in salt water. Right, a lot of water out there. What defines the marine world? So there's different types of marine habitats, just okay. like there were different types of freshwater habitats. Mm -hmm. You have pelagic habitats, which is deeper mm -hmm. oceans. You have the sea floor, which believe it or not, is an environment mm -hmm. unto itself. You have coral reefs, which are super biodiverse, mm -hmm. mangroves, tidal habitats, and you have estuaries. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the primary marine habitats that different species will live in. Hmm. So they differ in a number of ways. Let's go through a couple of these points. The first being availability of light, which hmm. you can certainly see from the pelagic region to the estuaries or the tidal pools, there's a big difference between the amount of light that's reaching, or I should say penetrating through the water to make it into the world of the organisms that live there. Correct. So that will lead to the fact that the average depth of the oceans is 2.3 miles deep. Wow. So somewhere that's 2.3 miles deep, you likely will never get that light that's gonna penetrate all the way to the bottom, right? right? Which means those animals there, well, they can't do photosynthesis, mm -hmm. so there's likely no plant. Whereas a coral reef habitat or a tidal habitat, you're gonna have a lot of light availability. Right, so with that depth also comes in the play of temperature. Temperature plays a huge part in what sort of animals can survive in different types of water. Right, so when you go deep down into the oceans, you start to get a lot colder mm -hmm. because cold water is more dense than hot water. One of the key things that makes up a marine ecosystem is the salinity, the amount of salt in the water. For it to be a marine environment, it has to be salt water. So let's get into some of the actual stats. And I love this. If only 3% of the Earth's water is fresh, that means 97% is salt water. And that means that when you take into account the total surface area of the Earth, 71% of it is covered in oceans or salt water. That's a very large percentage of our planet. Okay, so let's transition into some of the species that we love in the marine ecosystem. And we can't talk about the ocean without talking about sharks. Specifically today, we're going to talk about the tiger shark, the largest marine predator or shark, I should say, that we have ever been up close with in the water. We're picking the tiger sharks because you have had a very close encounter with a tiger shark. Face to mouth. Yeah, that, that was pretty crazy. But what we learned from that experience and what hopefully the audience learned from watching those videos is that tiger sharks are not that bad. Mm -mm. Sharks in general are not that bad. If they can clearly see you as a human, they're not gonna go after you. No, and they've managed to survive on our planet for more than 400 million years, and mm -hmm. their body has changed very little in that amount of time. So they've found incredible ways to adapt right. to surviving within the ocean ecosystem. Now, one of those adaptations is sharks are very sleek. Mm -hmm. They're very hydrodynamic. Mm -hmm. That's because their entire skeleton structure is made out of cartilage. Right which so. is very unique as compared to other fishes. In fact, the only bone that you find really in a shark is its jaws. And then of course its teeth are separate from the jaws. But when you, that's why in, the, in like museums, you don't see shark nope. skeletons. There aren't shark skeletons. There are shark jaws and teeth, but the rest of it just disintegrates when a shark dies. Yeah. Now cartilage is very lightweight mm -hmm. and it's very efficient. It's more flexible. That allows the animals to be very efficient in the water. Now what's unique about the teeth is that they're constantly growing and replacing themselves mm -hmm. throughout the life of the shark. So no matter what it's chomping onto, if it breaks a tooth, loses a tooth, there's just another tooth waiting in line to replace the tooth that was lost. 
A shark could literally go through thousands of teeth in a lifetime. Mm -hmm. They have an incredibly powerful bite force. Now, when it comes to humans and sharks occasionally interacting, one of those reasons and one of the species that most commonly interact with humans are tiger sharks. Mm -hmm. Because any human that's on a surfboard or a paddleboard that's out there in the water, from underneath, that human looks like a sea lion or a sea turtle. So mm -hmm. tiger sharks are notorious for having a bite out of humans to determine whether or not it's something that they can consume. Soon. Yeah, now when you take uh, into account the bite statistics and how many humans are going into the marine habitats every day, mm -hmm. literally, uh, you realize that the statistics are really small. Right. In fact, you're more likely to get hit by lightning than to ever get attacked by a shark. Right, and in many instances, sharks attack humans based on misidentification. Uh, sharks have a really cool electroreceptor organ which is our next vocabulary word yep. here in the marine section. Ampulae of Lorenzi. Am I saying that right? Ampulae of Lorenzini. Of Lorenzini. That's a that's a tough one. We'll put that up on the screen. Yep. So what is this unique electromagnetic receptor? So the ampulae of Lorenzini allows sharks to basically detect their environment through electrical receptors. Hmm. So all along the snouts of many shark species, you've got these tiny little receptors, which will actually detect the muscle movements from fish, mm -hmm. electrical muscle movements from fish. So every animal gives off a little bit of an electrical pulse mm -hmm. of our muscles. Uh, so when a shark is swimming to the ocean, even if it's murky water and they can't necessarily see, they're gonna rely on that ampullae Lorenzini to detect their fish. But let's take it from the potential danger of sharks. They are beautiful, incredible creatures that we mm -hmm. don't need to be afraid of to something a little closer to shore because we've done a lot of content where we've explored the tide pools. And our next animal that we're gonna talk about is one of, I think, everybody's favorite. It also ranks up there as one of the grossest looking. Yeah. The giant black sea hare. Yeah, that is another very booger-like creature. So giant sea hares belong to the gastropod family. Mm -hmm. And gastropods include snails, uh, land slugs, and mollusks. Right, very big, very blobby. They're invertebrates, which means that they don't have a backbone, they don't have a skeletal structure. Mm. They do have some structure in, internally. They have like a, a little shell. They do um, have a plate. That, that covers up some of their organs. Um, but they're, they're massive. They can grow to three feet in length and weigh 30 pounds. Now the one that we caught wasn't quite that big, but it was as big as my arm is long and it was heavy. It was probably 10 to 12 pounds. They are herbivores and they primarily feast upon seaweeds. Okay. Um, they're kind of like these little grazing cows or like a bulldozer that just slides along the basin of the tide pool. And they've got this really scratchy tongue called a radula. That radula is almost like a cheese grater as it like combs over algae, seaweeds, any sort of plant material that this giant gastropod can get its cheese grater mouth on, it's fair game. It is a large slug species, the largest, and there are a couple of other sea hare species, in fact, many sea hare species. Many of them are capable of inking. Mm -hmm. The giant black sea hare is not capable of inking. So if you encounter one in a tide pool, honestly, it's completely safe to interact with. It's not gonna bite you, not gonna sting you, not venomous, not poisonous, not gonna ink you. You can pick it up, hold it, don't put it in sunlight for too long. Always make sure you put it back down into the water uh, in a tide pool, and it'll be happy, you'll have a cool encounter, and there you have it, giant slugs. Okay, and that's gonna pretty much wrap up today's Ask a Biologist YouTube Back to School special. Mm -hmm. I feel like we learned a lot. Biomes are incredibly important. Yeah, and now when you go back to school, you're gonna tell teach all your friends what you learned. Yeah. Now, in the meantime, I know a lot of us are doing school from home right now. What we've done is procured an amazing list of episodes, the Back to School Brave Wilderness Special. Mm. And it's got a number of different animal species, all picked by us from the Brave Wilderness channel, including a number of the animals we talked about today. Excellent. So should we give them some homework? Well, yeah, the homework is to go watch the entire playlist of videos. That sounds good. And then I want a book report or a video report for each of those videos. A thousand words, no double space, you gotta have citations, and I want it on our desk by Monday morning. Whoa, 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 whoa. That sounds like a lot of homework. How about we meet somewhere in the middle? What if they just write in the comment section on all these videos why they like them so much or what they learned about that animal? Okay, that's fair enough. That's probably yeah. fair, right? All right, guys, thanks so much for joining us on this YouTube Back to School special. I'm Coyote Peterson. I'm Mario Dakota. Be brave. Stay wild. We'll see you on the next adventure. Thanks for watching, guys.